We're going to start the day off by hitting up Starship Progress happening right now in Boca Chica, Texas. Then we'll dive into some rocket drama between SpaceX and every other rocket company that can't reuse their rockets. We'll go over some upcoming missions, today's honorable mention, and then we'll finish with another segment of Kevin's Classroom. That's me, and this is SpaceX in the News. Starship SN4 is on deck as the next victim for a SpaceX stress test. Last week we said the stacking of its parts could begin any day now. And just a couple days later, it did begin. SN3 skirt that was salvaged after the previous stress test error has now been placed on the bottom of the SN4 LOX tank with legs and all included. And just today, the top of the methane tank was stacked onto that LOX portion. So we could very well see another trip back to the mount any day now for another cryo test. In fact, I kind of expect it. And if all goes well, the static fire of its three Raptor engines will go down, followed by some short hops. However, SN4 won't be the one to do the 20 click flight because it will never receive its flaps. The designs of the flap actuator and static aero design have been reset, in other words, changed. The flaps, actuator, and static aero are undergoing redesign for mass reduction and simplicity. So either SN5 or SN6 will be the star of that show. Again, Musk seems confident that building a Starship factory is the hardest part of all of this, which is why he's not super worried about the failures. Apparently, these early serial numbers make for good lawn ornaments. Hey, beats the crappy lawn ornaments in my yard. Oh, and guess what? SpaceX may only be on SN4 at the moment. <laughs> only. As if to imply they were going slower than ludicrous speed. But they are on serial number 26 for Raptor. If you'd like to join in on the fun going on down there in South Texas, why not put on a jersey? SpaceX is always hiring, but this particular job posting for a geek that can code good caught a lot of people's attention. Apparently, SpaceX is looking to go fully automated with their launch sequence from filling up the tanks to boom time. Not really all that surprising given SpaceX's ambitions in the past, but neat to learn nonetheless. Falcon 9 rockets already do a little bit of that, taking over control of the launch sequence at T minus 60 seconds. Vehicles and startup. Now let's get into some drama for your mommy. The chief of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, is whining about the free market. Who would have thunk it? Complaining that they have to lower their launch service prices by more than 30% to increase their shares on the international markets. Dmitry Rogozin tweeted, instead of honest competition, SpaceX is lobbying for sanctions against us and use price dumping with impunity. To which Elon Musk responded in his usual fashion by burning the whole conversation to the ground. Quote, SpaceX rockets are 80% reusable, Russia's is a whopping 0%. This is the actual problem. SpaceX isn't the problem, a lack of motivation within is. But I know I'm not one to talk. I don't even like thinking up new things to eat for dinner. But maybe if Russia moved on from their Soviet era technology, instead of creating the incentive for Americans to build such awesome rockets by jacking their Soyuz seat prices up and mocking us over it, they wouldn't be in this situation. Oh, and uh, spitting on Elon and laughing him out of the country in the early 2000s probably wasn't a good idea on their part either. It, it was, uh, there was some strange trips, that's for sure. Um. <laughs> but this week's theatrics doesn't end there. Oh no, the shadow has been cast over the entire rocket industry. Elon tweeted that the reason any other rocket providers even receive contracts from NASA is because of government intervention and lobbying. SpaceX rockets are inexpensive compared to the competition, and when someone tried to claim that SpaceX rockets aren't as reliable as others, Elon responded that not only is the current version of the Falcon rocket, the Block 5, just as reliable, it's also cheaper to insure, by over a million dollars. Ah yes, and SpaceX rockets are the only 100% American-made rockets rated to fly American astronauts. America. You know, I was going to wait until next month to release our new line of American Ingenuity merch, but now seems like quite the opportune time. Check out the link below to order yours now. And yes, Teespring does ship internationally. But let's not skip over some lightheartedness that happened this week as well. Elon offered his praise of Rocket Lab for experimenting with reusability. We went over their recent success in last week's honorable mention. Elon wrote that what they are doing is cool, but using helicopters just isn't feasible for SpaceX's bigger rockets and future plans to land on other celestial bodies. Still, he has a great respect for anyone who gets a rocket into orbit, we're all looking forward to the day that Starship joins the ranks of bona fide orbital rockets, but especially Elon, no doubt. Moving on to upcoming SpaceX missions. In an interview with Spaceflight Now, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine opened up about the current status of Crew Dragon in Demo 2. And he's fairly confident that astronauts Bob and Doug will be heading to the space station for a 110-day stay in late May, saying, quote, I think we're in good shape. 
I'm fairly confident that we can launch at the end of May. If we do slip, it's probably into June. It won't be much." End quote. After the recent snafu that occurred while NASA and SpaceX attempted to perform another parachute test from a heli, Jim said they're just going to call a mulligan on that one and perform a couple more drop tests out of a C-130 instead. Here we go, it's time to get your parachute fix in. The first test will simulate a double failure with one of the drogue chutes and one of the mains. Then they'll follow it up with another full test. However, NASA is already confident in the reliability of the parachute system, they just want more data. And yes, they're also reviewing the failure of a Merlin engine on SpaceX's last Starlink launch, a booster that successfully placed its record-setting fifth payload into orbit despite the hiccup. Quote, we've been doing some root cause of what caused the engine to fail, and what I've been told is that they've got a really good understanding of what the failure was, and it's not going to impact our launch, says Jim. The Dragon capsule to take the American astronauts to space is currently at the Cape undergoing pre-launch processing, as the commercial crew program does what it can to avoid the world's microbiology takeover at the moment. So far, no one at the team has fallen victim to it, but if that happens, Bridenstine says they have contingency plans. And he said if there is an outbreak, it will affect the launch date. Oh, but what's this? Jim just announced the launch date moments ago to be May 27th at 4.32 p.m. Eastern Time. I won't be going over any more details concerning that NASA spaceflight article, but if you want to learn more about what to expect with Dragon and Demo 2, make sure you check it out in the link below. SpaceX has clinched more future missions through German middleman company ExoLaunch that specializes in hooking up small sat developers with rideshare providers. Last year, SpaceX made the announcement that they would be entering the small sat rideshare market, launching a mission every month. And while dedicated small sat missions could start in December of this year, others could hitch a ride on a Starlink launch as early as this summer. The next launch is a Starlink launch that will place the seventh batch of 60 Starlink sats into low Earth orbit. It was supposed to happen last week, but it was delayed until next week, April 23rd, at 3.16 p.m. local time. Today, that booster underwent its static test in preparation for the flight. It previously flew on Demo-1, Radarsat, and Starlink's fourth mission. The fairing is also being reused from a previous Amos mission. Again, you can join me right here on my channel for that coverage. And then the next Starlink launch after that is expected to happen next month. Now let's move on to today's honorable mention. For today's honorable mention, we're going to do a speed round of a few breaking stories. First, the U.S. Space Force will begin accepting applications in May from current service members in any branch looking to make the move over to the new branch. One of the stipulations is that their chain of command has to be notified of their intention to apply. Good luck with that, fellas. Our second honorable mention is that the Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance, is still expected to launch in July, despite the current pandemic. Percy will search for evidence for past life on Mars and store samples for future return trips to Earth. If the rocket doesn't launch by August 5th, NASA will have to wait two more years for the next available launch window. And lastly, three space station occupants returned home this morning, including American astronauts Drew and Jessica. They landed in Kazakhstan in a Soyuz capsule, which rolled over afterward, but it made for an easier time getting them through the hatch and into their lawn chairs. Hey, 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 social distancing people. Now listen up. It's time to take another question in Kevin's classroom. No yelling on the bus! What's the difference between a full-flow rocket engine and a standard rocket engine? Wow, such an impressive question. You must really know your stuff, little lady. I'll try to simplify my answer as much as possible, but it's gonna be really difficult. This is definitely rocket science territory. So one thing that sets the full flow rocket engine apart from all the rest is the difficulty level it takes to build it, really. They're difficult to make because they're designed to be highly efficient, meaning they don't waste precious fuel like the rest of them. See, in order to make rocket engines work, they can't simply rely on pressure in the fuel tanks to feed the engine. Your bang wouldn't be powerful enough. It's kind of like using a normal garden hose to wash your dog. It just doesn't get the job done. Unless, of course, you put a nozzle on the hose to get the water moving faster and thus getting more of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Think Wally, not cookies. So that nozzle does what an engine bell is designed to do, but still there isn't enough fuel moving through the rocket nozzle to get it really moving. So we add a pump to our garden hose and turn it into a high pressure fire hose. These require an engine to suck water out of the tank. And what you're seeing here is pressure on display at 12 bar. SpaceX's full-flow Raptor engine crushes that number at 300 bar. But in the case of rocket engines, that means we would need to add a second engine to our engine with the job of sucking the fuel out of the propellant tanks, which means adding more weight, which is a bad thing in rocket science. So since we already have one engine, the engine itself, to combust the fuel and expel it outward, 
why not just also use it to suck the fuel out of the tanks by adding a couple pre-burners? In this case, we'll need one pre-burner for the fuel and one pre-burner for the oxidizer. Two turbines suck their individual propellant out of the tanks and toward the engine's combustion chamber where it explodes outward. But to keep those turbines spinning and also not waste any of that precious propellant, some of that propellant is cycled back to the opposite pre-burner where it combusts inside the engine to keep the turbine spinning and thus fuel pumping. And that exhaust is then fed into the main combustion chamber. Whereas in your standard rocket engine, some propellant is used only to run the pump and then just thrown overboard and wasted. I know that was a really heavy lesson to take in, but I hope the animations helped. They were provided by the everyday astronaut from his rocket engine video, Is SpaceX Raptor Engine King of Rocket Engines? So go check it out for a more in-depth explanation of the subject. Well, that's all the time I have for you guys today, but thank you for stopping by. And a very special thank you to all my eccentric members and patrons who keep this channel running, especially during such trying times as these. If you want more eccentric content and SpaceX news in your week, click on the appropriate links in the description below. Y'all have a nominal weekend, and until the next one, Godspeed.